let me tell you a little bit about my um, background. Um, I grew up on a small um, uh, piece of land in western Massachusetts. My father was a, a uh, college professor, but uh, he he had grown up in Michigan and always grown his own food, and he, um, you know, was raised in the country, and um, and that was the life that he wanted, and he, um, you know, continued to do that, and we were right next door to a very small dairy farm, and and his maybe I don't know his if it was his sort of Midwestern roots or you know the way that he had had grown up with uh, you know a lot of siblings and and being close to farms he uh, established a very close relationship with uh, the dairy farmer next door and this was a small dairy they were mil milking uh, between 15 and 30 cows depending on the year and it wasn't organic they weren't uh, you know, at that time, organic milk was, you know, not really something that was known. This is the 1970s, but uh, we spent a lot of time there, and and I really, um, I became uh, really enamored by uh, that kind of life. The you know the 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 milking of the cows and the feeding of the cows and throwing hay into the barn and you know it was tough and it was um it was it was not always the easiest work and i didn't get paid very much to do it sometimes i just did it for free but it was very fulfilling and we had a, a very strong community relationship. We made maple syrup together in the winter and they put, they plowed our garden, big garden, and uh, put uh, manure on it in the spring and they plowed our long driveway in the winter and and then we helped them with, you know, if they had a difficult, difficult birth for a cow or if um, you know, we'd help with the milking sometimes. If they got behind, we definitely always helped in haying season. <laughs> and they taught me a lot too. You know how to weld. Um, you know how a carburetor works, and you know a lot of a lot of different skills. Farming is an is an interesting profession because it's not a, a it doesn't take a singular skill. You have to be a, a, a botanist and a veterinarian and an economist and a uh, salesperson and a mechanic and a, a lot of a lot of different things go into it. It's a it's what one beginning farmer that I worked with referred to as sort of the Swiss Army knife. Uh, uh, profession. That dairy that we lived next to closed down and it became a lumber yard and the whole culture changed, you know, the community relationships and I felt that loss very deeply. And sustainability has always been important to me because I saw, you know, the, the, the struggles that the small farmers were going through and you know, the difficulty that uh, people had staying in business and the repercussions of small farms going out of business on uh, communities and on, um, you know, the connection that people have to their food. Part of the uh, struggle that I had when I first came was that there, there really wasn't any sustainable agriculture happening at Michigan State University and uh, in in the first month my major professor um, showed me this flyer for a sustainable ag discussion group. I think there were four of us at the first meeting um, and it, it sort of developed and it, it, you know I had I wasn't. I was involved in that because I, you know, I was really frustrated by uh, you know, while I was doing a, 
you know, a sustainable project. I was working with asparagus and um, looking at cultural and biological controls and reduce, uh, reduced uh, risk pesticides for um, controlling root disease. But, um, I, you know, the community aspect and, and discussing the politics and um, really trying to move the sustainable agriculture movement forward um, not just through production, but through uh, a activism and through uh, a, an understanding of, you know, what what a uh, what the way that farms are connected to the rest of the world in a, in a system, and the way that a farm itself is a system, and so. That group actually ended up um, growing to the point where it became the, the Michigan State University Student Organic Farm, which is where we are right now. Um, and they are producing on uh, about 10 acres here at the horticulture farm at Michigan State. And that was an idea that came out of, um, out of that you know, a little discussion group that we started. Um, so, when I finished my master's degree, uh, I worked for a, a natural products company uh, in Lansing for two years, and that was a great experience. I, uh, I worked um, probably in at least half of the United States, testing a, uh, a product that um, encouraged uh, beneficial uh, microbes to grow, which decreased the need for fertilizer and um, uh, other inputs. And um, that company was sold, but you know, by the end I realized that I didn't want to just be working with a single input. I was more interested in the, what I would, what I had referred to earlier as the, the system uh, of farming and that that, you know, really um, was, uh, was what was compelling to me, you know, having come from a place where uh, not just the ecological system, uh, but the uh, community system uh, is uh, a part of uh, thinking about and um, working with and uh, encouraging uh, the, de the development of healthy and sustainable farms. And so um, I started a PhD here and have been working with first generation organic farmers uh, specifically. Uh, I was mostly interested in, in first generation farmers because uh, first generation farmers being farmers that didn't grow up on a farm. So, you know, it's hard enough to make a living and I, I, I've worked with a lot of conventional farmers that really struggle, you know, 90% of farmers work off, 90% of farmers have a, a um, spouse that works off the farm now for health insurance and, and extra income and it's a very difficult living uh, and that you know that's not just organic farms that's all farms and that, and that's uh, you know it's a challenge so to get into something you know when you're not inheriting any land and you don't have the um, the knowledge that uh, is developed through the process of growing up on a farm, it, it, it's, a, it's a much bigger challenge and I was interested in why somebody would choose to do this. And you know, the values that, um, that uh, that takes tend to, um, I found through my research, um, often be related, are they often related to um, uh, a commitment to ecology and 
um, sustainability and uh, self-sufficiency and a lot of the things that go along with traditional organic production. Also because first generation farmers are often starting out very resource limited, uh, the organic farm system works well for a lot of them because you get a price premium, uh, it's easier to sell direct to consumers, um, so you, you cut out the, the, you know, the, the middle uh, warehouse that sells it to a, you know, a grocery store or a processor or whatever. It's changed a lot in the time that I've been involved with it, which is, you know, only, um, you know, the last 20 years. And, and yeah, but 20 years isn't that long, you know, in, in terms of make major changes in um, the culture at Michigan State University, you know, we're sitting in one of uh, seven or eight. Sure, but change happens slowly, and I and I and I I do my part, but I'm not the only one, and it's uh, it's it's something that that um, that takes. Um, a lot of committed people and um, a lot of hard work and not just in the the practice of farming but also in um, the the political work um, that it takes to get support for uh, and and, uh, um, and in in the early days, even just, you know, uh, uh, respect. It's very difficult for a conventional farmer to, the idea that a, a thousand acre corn farmer in the middle of Iowa, 500 miles from the nearest town of ever, any size, who owns a million and a half dollars of an equipment and is, uh, you know, deeply in debt and working off the farm could transition to a system like this is, it's just not, it's not feasible. And, and I think that we, um, that we do see things in black and white a little too much when it comes to, um, farming system, organic good, conventional bad, I, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm pro-farmer and I, and I want agriculture in the United States to survive and certainly um, I work very hard to, um, uh, to encourage sustainability and I believe in organic production but I also believe that there, um, you know, that that it has to grow slowly, and that uh, that there that that there are farmers that work really hard, and I've never met one, and I've worked with a lot of conventional farmers who wants to poison the land and the rivers and doesn't care about you know the health of the the you know community or the soil or themselves. That's just not. Um, you know, it's, it's just not that black and white and that's, you know, part of the reason that, um, my website, uh, www.beginningfarmers.org tends to be sustainably focused and, you know, provides a lot of organic information. My dissertation project, um, I work with small organic farmers, um, but that's because that's who a lot of these first generation farmers tend to be. Um, I don't, uh, 
I don't uh, I don't like the um, the fact that uh, that the sustainable agriculture community, the organic agriculture community, and the conventional or industrial or whatever you want to call it um, mainstream agriculture community um, see each other um, as enemies in a lot of ways because I think that in my experience anyway um, 90 or 95 percent of the stuff they have in common. They have the same needs. They're trying to do the same things. They want the same things. They love the land. They love farming. They want to stay in it. It's not an easy business to be in. They struggle to make a living uh, and they take pride in um, what they produce and they do it in um, the best way that they know how and they uh, do it in uh, an effort to try to continue to make a living on the farm and um, a lot of farmers have gone out of business <laughs> in the last uh, well if you if you look at the last hundred years I think it was uh, over 30 percent of um, Americans were employed in agriculture in some capacity and now it's less than 2%. The Farm Bill, which is, it's a, it's a, it's a significant part of the, um, the federal budget. It's somewhere around 2%, I believe. Um, but 65% of that is for nutrition programs. Um, food stamps, WIC, um, school lunch programs, uh, WIC being women, infants, and children. Uh, and um, so that's the majority of what that farm bill is. The rest of it, um, you know, it depends on the year, but um, crop insurance and um, commodity subsidies and conservation. And the conservation part is, is pretty new. Um, uh, range around uh, 12 to maybe maybe conservation is as low as 8% depending on the year maybe uh, but they're all around you know 12% the rest of the the rest of the programs uh, research beginning farmer programs uh, uh, organic programs uh, uh, that um, help organic farmers pay for the cost of certification, um, that, uh, uh, that, you know, pay for organic research, that, um, you know, in, 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 encourage um, organic farming through, well, it, through through the conservation program and a number of other and a number of other things the national organic program itself costs um, a certain amount of money all of that fits into this little two percent of the farm bill um, and I think that that has to gradually change um, I, I, I think that the fact that um, the top ten percent of farm earners, the top 10% of farms in terms of income get 80% of the subsidies in Michigan, um, including the, in the conservation subsidies, is, um, is problematic. Um, I think that uh, direct payments and um, farm Basically, direct payments, I think, are, are going to be gone in the next farm bill anyway, but they're being um, sort of moved into this risk management system, which is basically a subsidized insurance system so that um, uh, commodity farmers don't, um, don't 
assume the same amount of risk that a diversified farmer does. And we need to have um, equitable uh, systems for um, if we're going to support our farmers. It needs to be done more equitably. Um, there's reasons for that too, you know. It's very, very hard for, uh, you know, a, a um, you know, an, an, an agent in the National Resources Conservation Service to evaluate the value and the risk associated with a farm that sells 40 crops to, you know, uh, three farmers markets and 500 CSA members and uh, three food co-ops. It's a lot easier to figure out what the risk is and the price is when it's a thousand acres of corn. There are a number of factors that go into this and, and it, you know, it's, it's not going to be an easy thing to change, um, but I, I think it needs to change because um, right now we're encouraging um, a certain kind of agriculture, uh, agricultural production over um, other kinds of agricultural production. Um, specifically, we're spending a lot of money on <laughs> a lot of money on rice which we don't need to be growing in America anyway. We're spending a lot of money subsidizing corn. We're spending a lot of money subsidizing soybeans. And these aren't things that we directly eat. They end up in um, a lot of food that isn't particularly healthy for us. Um, a lot of them end up being sent overseas. And, um, you know, the... Um, and they're often grown in, in large monocultural, um, not ecologically diverse systems. And that's not the farmer's fault. That's the way that our agricultural system has developed over the years. And, and there are reasons for it, as I've tried to explain. And once a uh, once something has that kind of momentum, it's really hard to change it. But um, we need to be working on figuring out ways to change it, to encourage more um, uh, more production of fresh vegetables and more availability of fresh vegetables at a reasonable price. You know, you can buy a, a cheeseburger at McDonald's that's 400 calories for a dollar. You know, to grow 400 calories worth of lettuce here, or uh, Swiss chard there, costs a lot more than that. And, um, and you know, the, the government systems that, ha that are in place are uh, partly responsible for that and we need to be encouraging our legislators to um, support the programs uh, such as organic and um, beginning farmers you know we're looking at um, one estimate is that 70% of agricultural land will be turned over in the next 20 years. And some of it will go to the next generation, but, you know, some of it won't, you know. The kids are becoming doctors, moving to the city, whatever. And we need people to, to fill that void. Uh, the, in, the price of oil is increasing and... and we don't want to be dependent on foreign oil, and um, so producing food locally, you know, whether it's whether it's corn and soybeans, and you know, we're selling we're selling that 
here and uh, processing it here and um, or whether it's uh, you know fresh vegetables sold at farmers markets you know I think um, we need to be we need to be looking towards um, some inevitabilities in the future with our agricultural policy that supporting uh, local farmers that getting to know your local farmer to that visiting local farms going and buying food at, um, at uh, food co-ops at least but farmers markets and um, maybe even you know trying a, a CSA share at some point is an important way to support uh, an alternative kind of agriculture it would, it would be nice if Americans realized that they pay a very small proportion of their disposable income for food and that you know paying 20 percent more for local food that's fresh that's from somebody that you know that goes back into your local economy um, is um, is a is a important thing to do and and is a an unselfish act and um, also in the long run has the potential to benefit all of us.